Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojciechowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's virtual uh, weekly seminar of the Center. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media and Latinx communities across the Americas. And today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Ignacio Siles is professor in the School of Communication at Universidad de Costa Rica. Facundo Suenzo, doctoral student in Media, Technology and Society at Northwestern University and an affiliate of the Center, will introduce Ignacio in just a minute. But before we do that, I would like to start by acknowledging that uh, Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho Chunk Nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes and is still home to 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about Native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Now let's go back to today's uh, speaker. But first, I will uh, briefly say how the seminar will unfold. First, Facundo will tell us more about Ignacio's research and career in just a minute. Then Ignacio will deliver his remarks. And after that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar and Facundo will moderate. At the end, I will go back uh, on the screen to deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us and Ignacio for agreeing to be part of this with us today. And without further ado, Facundo, the screen is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Pablo, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm incredibly honored to have been invited today to introduce Professor Ignacio Siles and to co-moderate this fantastic presentation at the Latinx Digital Media. Uh, Dr. Siles is a professor of media and technology studies in the School of Communication and a research in the Centro de Investigación en Comunicación, CICOM, at the University of Costa Rica. Dr. Siles has ob obtained his BA in Communication at the University of Costa Rica, a Master also in Communication at the University of Montreal, and his PhD in Media, Technology and Society at Northwestern University. Professor Siles has recently published a book a Transnational History of the Internet in Central America, 1985-2000, uh, which explores the early development of the Internet in an understudied region and connects the past of the Internet in Central America with its present. The book also emphasizes the importance of transnational processes in the historical development of the Internet. He is the author also of Network Itself, Trajectories of Blogging in the United States and France, and Por un Sueño Enredado, Una Historia de Internet en Costa Rica. Professor Siles author and co-authored several books, chapters, and articles, which have appeared in distinguished journals in the field, such as New Media and Society, the International Journal of Communication, Journal of Community and Communication, Digital Journalism, and Big Data and Society, among others. Please join me in welcoming Ignacio Siles. Thank you, Facundo, for that uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it's very nice to finally meet you. Mm. Uh, and um, it's really an honor to be here. I've had the opportunity to listen to some of the previous talks, and they have been amazing. So uh, thank you, Pablo, once again, for your kind invitation. And thank you, Mora, for your work in organizing this. And of course, thank you all for taking your time to be here, even in these incredibly challenging circumstances. So I'm going to share my screen. And I trust, Facundo, you will let me know if there's an issue. 
Okay, so today I'd like to talk about this project on how users uh, in Costa Rica relate to algorithms of digital media, right? And I'd like to invert a dominant analytical preference in the study of datafication by asking not what algorithms are doing to people, but rather what people are doing with algorithms. So I'll look at the practices of ordinary people in their daily life in Costa Rica, which is where I am from and where I currently are. Um, and, and so rather than activists, you know, trying to obfuscate the agency of, of algorithms. And I'll be focusing on three particular uh, platforms, which are Netflix, Spotify, and TikTok. And I'll explain in a little bit why I chose these three platforms. So I try to illustrate my argument by including this famous drawing from Uruguayan artist Joaquin Torres Garcia, America Invertida, or Inverted America, America the Continent. And he meant it, of course, as an artistic statement, right, to say that the South was his North. Uh, but I'd like to use it to suggest that if we invert what we know about datafication and privilege users rather than tech companies or platforms themselves, then we can gain a new understanding or a new perspective on what datafication means. And by datafication, I am referring to the transformation of daily life experiences, uh, relations, and identities into data by these tech companies. So my starting question is, uh, is this one, right? So what does it mean to, to live in a datafied society, uh, an age of algorithmic power? And I'm, I'm guessing it's not really uh, necessary to clarify in this context or in the context of this presentation, how prevalent algorithms are in our relationship with platforms, right? Uh, so they are literally everywhere and, and seem to be shaping most, of our, most aspects of our interactions with digital media. So there have been um, you know, several ways to answer these questions. I use these two just as illustrations of what I think are dominant approaches to the study of datafication, but of course there are many others. Uh, one of them emphasizes the idea of data colonialism, right? So how tech companies are creating a new social order uh, by combining the extractive practices of historical colonialism and new computational capacities. So in this way, uh, Coldry and, and Mejias argue, humans are increasingly deprived from their autonomy. The other approach emphasizes instead the study of platforms themselves, right? So how they have a particular set of mechanisms or logics that are reconfiguring social life and social institutions. So this, despite their many contributions, I think these two approaches are, are limited in at least two important ways. So they both tend to think of datafication as processes that stand sort of outside of, of outside of culture. Both data colonialism and platformization tend to operate in sort of a cultural void. Um, and the other shortcoming I think is that they tend to take for granted the experiences of users, right? They tend to assume how people experience datafication in their daily life. So this project seeks to overcome these two shortcomings. But just to be clear from, from the get-go, by trying to understand how users enact their agency, I do not seek to naturalize or validate in any way the, corp the corporate practices of these platforms, right? I, I actually think that by looking at the practices of ordinary users, we can actually contribute to the project of conducting critical studies of algorithms and datafication. So a similar scenario characterizes dominant accounts of algorithmic power. So in general, I argue that when scholars talk about uh, algorithmic power, they mean four things, uh, either combined or separately. First, that the power of algorithms stems from the complex, a complex and complicated computational capacity that overpowers the human brain and that turn people into easy targets of manipulation. Second, that algorithms are only the tip of the iceberg, right? That behind them lies an assemblage of networks of institutions and, and technologies that have become sort of the infrastructure of daily life. Third, that algorithms are invisible to, to, to all of us, to most people, and therefore, therefore it is almost impossible uh, for governments to regulate them and for users to actually understand them. And finally, that algorithms have fractal effects, which means that their consequences uh, vary from place to place and from time to time. So a growing number of studies have begun to challenge those four premises over the past years, and they have done so by showing two things. First, that even if we don't see algorithms, we can make sense of them and assign them value in our lives. And you probably have seen uh, a growing number of scholars using uh, concepts such as folk theories or imaginaries or, or beliefs. And the second way in which they have challenged this, this uh, idea of algorithmic power is by showing that even if we don't understand algorithms, we can relate to them and we can actually incorporate them into our daily lives. Um, so I'll, I'm going to build on, on these uh, studies, but also try to expand them in ways that I hope will become more obvious uh, throughout the presentation. 
but one way in which I think we can, or we need to go beyond what has been done regarding user agency in times of algorithmic power is by, I, I don't think at this point it is enough to show that people uh, think in certain ways of algorithms, but we should be able to explain why they think the way they do and, and, and how that matters for the way they relate to algorithms. So I'll provide, so to speak, a, a, a cultural answer to, to that question. I would also like to argue before I show you my, my empirical findings that we need to further situate the study of datafication historically. So after all, it, it, this is not the first time that we hear about forms of technological power that overwhelm humans. Uh, in many ways, the debates about datafication rehash old concerns about the power of media and technology in society, right? So if you're from communication studies, you, you are uh, very familiar with the concept of hypodermic needles. Or if you're from the SDS field, uh, you probably have learned a lot about, you know, machines making history. So the main object, objection that people have made to this argument I'm making is that datafication is somewhat of a different beast, right? That it is more pervasive and surreptitious than, than previous media. So what I ask in this project is that we turn these ideas on the historical singularity of datafication from premises into empirical questions. One way to do so is by envisioning datafication as culture in the sense famously given by James Carey. So to understand datafication as a way to bring certain realities into being, right? To create them, to sustain them, to continuously repair them. That also means as, as Nick Siever has uh, noted recently that thinking of algorithms as things that need to be culturally enacted through practices. So that is the, the task that I set out for, for this project. So in the, in the process of culturally sit, situating the study of datafication and algorithms in particular, I'd like to argue that Latin America is perhaps the best place to do so, right? Of course, there are many challenges that remain associated with the digital divide, but platforms have, have grown exponentially over the past years in the region. So Netflix, on the one hand, has been around for almost a decade in Latin America. Actually, Latin America was the second region in the world uh, after Canada where it became available outside of the United States. And of course, Netflix is producing or has produced original content uh, for at least five years in various countries of the regions, especially those that have a larger industry and, and, lar and big markets uh, for consumption. Latin America is also uh, a model that Spotify uses uh, or would like to reproduce in other parts of the world. Mexico City, for example, is often considered Spotify's world capital. And to be <laughs> sure, the, the uptake of Spotify's probably also related to the rise of reggaeton as a global phenomenon. And we now know that there are as many TikTok users in Latin America as there are in Europe and only 2% less than in the United States. I would also like to argue that Costa Rica in particular is an ideal site for conducting this project. And so to illustrate this, I chose a few screenshots of news stories from 1996, the year when Intel chose the country to build one of its largest manufacturers um, in, in the world. And I think this neatly captures an important transformation in the country's national identity. This was the moment when Costa Rica embraced the idea of becoming sort of a technology nation as a way to dissociate from being a banana republic, right? And so since then, uh, the country has become the largest high-tech producer in the region. Every statistic involving Costa Rica is always per capita because it is, after all, a very small country. Costa Rica is also uh, among the heaviest users of social media in Latin America. It is the heaviest Facebook and WhatsApp user, according to, to some sources. And it also has the smallest gap in Latin America in the use of mobile internet between urban and rural uh, places, which I think it's a very interesting uh, statistic if you want to account for, uh, you know, the digital divide and all, in all its effects in how people relate to technology. So why, what exactly did I do in this project? Uh, first, I selected three platforms. I followed Pablo and Eugenia Michelstein's evocative idea uh, that we live in digital environments, right? And in practice, I think this forces us to recognize in our research that people are not users of only one platform, but many. So I chose three platforms that rely heavily on algorithmic recommendations and that had different historical trajectories in order to capture both established and emerging user practices. I conducted more than 100 interviews with users from different social demographic backgrounds, uh, age 18 to 60 years old. During these interviews, I also asked participants to open their Netflix or Spotify accounts, uh, the project them on the screen and then discuss with them specific algorithmic recommendations and their most common use practices. So this technique has received several names. Um, the one I use is the scroll, bow, uh, scroll back technique. So I also carried 
12, carried out 12 focus groups with another 60 participants in order to capture, cap, capture the formation of ideas uh, about algorithms through social interaction with other people. And finally, I borrowed this technique from conflict resolution called Rich Pictures, where I asked participants in focus groups to draw or graphically represent how they understood platforms and their algorithmic recommendations. And I'll show you in a bit what that looks like. I think it added an interesting way to triangulate data sources and, and ways of understanding how people uh, think of, of algorithms in particular. So as soon as I began collecting and analyzing the data, I started thinking of how relevant the framework of domestication was to make sense of my findings, right? So by domestication, Roger Silverstone famously referred to how people appropriate both artifacts and content into the spaces and times of their daily lives. So he put forth a series of dynamics, appropriation, objectification, incorporation, conversion, that I imagine most people uh, here are familiar with. But I think that we often forget that Silverstone also meant domestication as a theoretical intervention, right? He was trying also to counterbalance two theoretical extremes. On the one hand, uh, the Frankfurt School and its ideas on overdetermination, and on the other, uh, the idealization of media consumers and their agency. So in a similar way, I think the notion of domestication can actually help us to balance out a similar dichotomy in the contemporary study of algorithms. That is, on the one hand, the premises of algorithmic power, as I have discussed them, and on the other, considering users as agents of technological change. So to capture this dynamic, I'd like to posit the notion of mutual domestication. And by this, I mean the idea that users enact algorithmic recommendations as they incorporate them into their daily lives. But these algorithms are also designed to adjust these enactments in order to colonize users. So I, I see this as a cyclical process characterized by, by a series of dynamics, some of which are similar to those Silverstone identified but others are more typical of life in digital environments, right? So in this project, I explore five dynamics of mutual domestication. The first one is personalization, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in just a few seconds, but to me, personalization is uh, the ways in which personal relationships are built between users and platforms. Integration, which is how algorithmic recommendations are combined into a matrix of cultural codes and capacities in relations. Um, and then rituals, uh, which means to me how users incorporate algorithms into the spatial and temporal processes in their daily life. Conversion, which is uh, the same as Silverstone theorized it, that means how people transform their private consumption of algorithms and media platforms into a public issue, how they discuss with other what they do privately. And then resistance, which is an explicit discussion of how people challenge various aspects of platforms and algorithms as a way to enact their agency. For the sake of time, in the remainder of the presentation, I'll be talking only about the first three dynamics, but I, I wanted to, to mention the overall framework that I am working on in this project. So let me begin with personalization. Personalization has actually been a key in the study of datafication. Usually scholars uh, focus on profiling mechanisms, right? Or the transformation of users into these data doubles that enable tech companies um, to influence their behavior. So here the premise is that people give their data because they want to, they want relevant personal recommendations. And I think that's definitely part of it. But I also think that as useful as this dominant approach is, uh, I'd like to suggest that it also misses uh, the point or at least a, an interesting part of the point. So I'd like to provide a different way of conceptualizing personalization by defining it as the establishment of a personal relationship between users, platforms, and algorithms. So I developed this by discussing three specific uh, personalization dynamics. First, personalization refers to how users experience algorithms as a form of, inter of personal interpolation. And I'll use the case of Netflix to illustrate this. Second, it refers to how users personify platforms. And I'll talk about the case of Spotify to illustrate this. And third, personalization refers to efforts to build a relationship with algorithms that build on uh, interpolation and personification, and I'll use the case of TikTok to illustrate this. So the belief that users are being addressed in a personal matter through algorithms is a first key to me to understand personalization. So I theorize this as, as, a, as a process of algorithmic interpolation, right? The work embedded in algorithms to convince users that platforms like Netflix are speaking directly to them, to hail them in particular ways and thus offer them subject positions. 
So Netflix uh, interface is strategically designed to make users feel they are receiving content that has been prepared exclusively for them. So Althusser's classic interpolation formula, hey, you there, uh, is enacted, enacted on Netflix through the question, who's watching? And the mandatory process of creating a profile on the platform is offered to users as a way to respond to this question. So when I asked the person who chose this avatar on the screen why she had selected it, she responded, well, I don't know if there is an equal number of male or female avatars on Netflix, but this is the only female morena or brown skin avatar there is. So users typically search for an image that best capture a defining feature of themselves and, and their identities, right? Whether a physical attribute or a personality trait. So I think this process creates or invites users to recognize themselves as interpolated subjects. And then answering the question, who is watching, then paves the, the way for other interpolation mechanisms on the platform's interface. The content is displayed under section, sections such as you continue watching for you or recommended for you, topics for you and because you watched. And going back to Professor Valdivia's talk a few weeks back, I think there's something interesting to say as well on on how Latinidad and womanhood is represented on Netflix, especially when the platform creates, creates these sort of associations uh, through their, their, their row of, of images and, and categories that, that it suggests and provides to users. So the role of genres is problematized then in Netflix algorithmic interpolation, right? Netflix includes multiple features as part of recommendations, uh, including images, names of categories, content descriptions, recommendation percentages, and icons of thumbs to reinforce the sense of interpolation. Um, so in short, Netflix does not offer a single recommendation, but rather bundles of features aimed at interpolating users in specific ways. So here I try to exemplify how Netflix recommended its original series and with an E, uh, to different of our interviewees, a 25-year-old miscellaneous worker, a 39-year-old business administrator, and then a 39-year-old university professor in, in human rights. So Netflix interpolation works very successfully when users feel that such bundles of symbolic features convey a meaningful recommendation that allow them to fulfill their expectations. But on other occasions, when they thought that an interpretive contract had been broken, they tended to resist such forms of hailing. For Althusser, interpolation also supposed the existence of a unique and central subject, right, which interpolates all individuals. So he used Christian I religious ideology to illustrate this point. So this was also the case of Netflix. Users treated the platform as a central subject that hailed them, uh, like the person quoted here uh, on the right of the screen who compared Netflix to an all-knowing subject who could reward her good behavior if she constantly obeyed him. So this example also helps to illustrate a second dynamic of personalization, namely uh, the tendency to treat platforms as a person-like entity. Here are some of the rich pictures that users drew during our focus groups when we asked them how they understood Spotify. So as you can see, a common way to depict the platform was by characterizing it as having features such as eyes, hands, legs, uh, hair, and even a smiling face. In the figure on the left, there is no major distinction in how humans and Spotify are, are actually represented. Users also employed uh, expressions such as a little dummy or a toy, un muñequito, or my little body to refer to Spotify. The one on the bottom doesn't look very friendly to me, uh, but I guess you could say the same about some of my friends. Um, so this was also a common tendency during the verbal descriptions of platforms. Um, this is one of my favorite exchanges during the, the focus groups. So during this conversation, a user that we named Gloriana realized the tendency to personify Spotify. So her immediate, immediate reaction was to tone down this tendency by expressing a desire not to humanize it, right? But as an alternative, she still put forward the notion of a person whose face is always hidden from plain sight or who is not easy to recognize. So as this conversation reveals, users also employed human-like characteristics to conceptualize those features they don't like about Spotify. They criticize it uh, and they criticize receiving unrequested uh, algorithmic recommendations constantly by defining the platform as a very annoying dude or the most intense of your friends. So personifying Spotify is a crucial way to naturalize issues of surveillance, right? So they, they, there was a generalized belief among our interviewees that Spotify was watching everything they did on the platform. Yet more than a big brother, Spotify was seen more as a dear brother 
it is, after all, a body, right? So users conceived of surveillance mostly as a necessary condition for receiving the benefit of useful recommendations. Silvio Weisbord and, and Soledad Segura have a very uh, interesting paper uh, where they argue that in Latin America, the politics of data surveillance work differently uh, than in the United States. So this is particularly, particularly salient, I would argue, in Costa Rica, which has built a national identity around the idea of peace uh, since 1948, when the military was abolished. So surveillance means a very different thing in a place like Costa Rica, uh, where there's no historical antecedent to actually make sense of what that would mean in, in other places. So personalization actually culminates in the establishment of a particular relationship with algorithms. So I illustrate this dynamic with the case of TikTok. Some researchers have recently uh, begun to move away from a view of the user algorithmic, uh, algorithm uh, relationship as constant and stable. So many have opted for Stuart Hall's classic notion of decoding to explain how algorithms become meaningful uh, for people. But I'd like to go a step uh, further and argue that users' relationship with algorithms undergo a series of passages through which attachment is actually performed. So I think attachment is a much better term than addiction, actually, to account for people's relationship with platforms and algorithms. And I'm borrowing uh, the term of attachment from Antoine Ignaud and Emily Gomat's study of how people leave their attachment to things like music and drugs, which is an excellent paper uh, from 1999, I think. So in other words, it is not that, what, what I argue is not that users establish a relationship with algorithm that is either dominant or negotiated or resistant to use Stuart Hall's uh, terms. But I argue that it's more like they follow, negotiate and resist algorithms all at once. So let me show you how that worked in practice in the case of, of TikTok. So for most people that I spoke with, with using TikTok began with a pe period of experimentation. Users said they had to figure out how the app worked and what it was all about. So here the logic is one of control, right? Of discovering what user actions lead to certain behavior, behaviors of algorithms in order to achieve personalization. But then this relationship with algorithms evolves. So users put aside the issue of control to favor the language of collaboration or mutual training. So users training algorithms what they like while learning from algorithms how to train them. There is a clear distribution in this case of responsibilities and capacities to achieve this end. So once users felt that personalization had been achieved on TikTok through collaboration, another passage typically occurs. Users feel that they eventually can let everything in the hands of algorithms as one of our interviewees put it. During those moments, uh, no more training is necessary. Users can allow themselves to quote another person the right to be happy. Um, to experience personalized content on TikTok without having to actually interfere. But this should not be confused with inaction. Uh, I think it is more about active passivity in Antoine Ignon's sense. It is not about moving from activity to passivity, but to act in order to be acted on by algorithms. TikTok also needs to be maintained in order to keep the mutual love uh, between users and algorithms going. So a new passage is then required to preserve TikTok's algorithmic personalization from decay. So I refer to this specific passage as care, right? So being careful means conceiving of the relationship with algorithms as something that needs to be dealt with continuously to avoid the decay of personalization. So the logic of care is just one of preservation rather than control or training or even collaboration. And a final passage is the recognition of addiction. Users mentioned several reasons to account for their addiction to TikTok, right? So the video, videos are like literally like memes, the short format of, of the content, the overall apps design, the infinite scrolling, the easiness and uh, allure of the swipe gesture and the availability of, of time to use the app while the, they stayed at home during the pandemic, for example. But I treat these, as, as, these reasons as expressions of the particular kind of attachment that users had established with TikTok uh, and with its algorithms through the process I have discussed. So by examining these passages, I think it becomes obvious that the relationship with algorithms constantly varies over time. And this also invites us to recognize that the agency of users is fraught with tensions and even contradictions rather than an all or nothing condition, right? And I think this is a much better response to claims that algorithms have fractal effects. Uh, we should also take into consideration that people 
might have sort of a fractal agency as well, that their agency is not all or nothing or stable, but that it can be enacted in a multiplicity of ways, even uh, relating with the same platforms algorithms. So I hope to have shown how my approach to personalization, uh, which focuses on users as culturally situated, helps to broaden our understanding of the reasons that lead people to provide their data to technology companies. So users certainly personalize their profile to receive relevant uh, algorithmic recommendations, but they also do so to sustain a communication relationship with a person like being that speaks to them, that interpolates them, that demands their attention and reactions to which they are attached and that also attaches them to other people. So let's consider now the second dynamic, uh, which I've called integration. And with this notion, what I wanna do is actually to nuance dominant accounts of how users make choices informed by algorithms. So it's, scholars have shown that algorithms perpetuate the neoliberal tendency to make individuals perceive themselves as choosing subjects. And I think that's uh, absolutely part of it. But I, by, Focusing on what I call integration, I'd like to supplement that view and argue that algorithms don't work entirely alone, nor do they act as the only determinant of cultural consumption, right? So instead, I wanna show how users integrate uh, algorithmic recommendations into a matrix of sources and relations based on their sociocultural backgrounds and interests. So this idea can actually be compared to grounded theories and its own notion of integration, right? Of the linking categories that lead to theoretical constructs that feed with certain data. So in a similar way, I think it is a work of reconciling, um, of reconciliation through which people actually consider multiple and overlapping realities and then turn them into one construct or, or a choice. So I'd like to provide three examples of this kind of integration work. So how people incorporate different criteria when they decide what they wanna watch on Netflix, how individuals integrate certain cultural capacities as they decide what recommendations to follow on Spotify, and how TikTok users incorporate their experiences with uh, various media technologies to make sense of recommendations on TikTok. So algorithms were one among many sources that Netflix users employed to make their choices. People, people typically combine a number of criteria to decide what they wanna watch. And this included the traditional role of opinion leaders, which remain uh, very important to some people, the people whose opinion you actually trust, uh, production characteristics, whether there's a leading actor or an, act or an actress in a certain movie or a particular director. Uh, people value actually Netflix's role in creating and developing original content. I was a little bit surprised by this, but many associated Netflix with the notion of quality and therefore received positively any recommendation that the platform had for them about its original content. And some search uh, for reviews of films or series on specialized websites to determine if they wanted to watch something. And the vast majority of them employed social media, right? To either ask or to monitor recommendations. So users integrate both algorithmic recommendations and all these criteria into their lives and assign various weights to them, depending on a matrix of social, cultural, and personal codes. So in this way, they create their own repertoires and hierarchy, hierarchies of, of criteria. So when we look at the case of Spotify, we can also see how people integrate specific cultural capacities as they decide whether to follow an algorithmic recommendation or not. The users that I interviewed oscillated between two tendencies, to reject recommendations from Spotify when they felt these were too annoying uh, or to accept them when they felt this allowed them to be a part of conversations about music and technology. So the first, posi the first position I think must be situated culturally, right? Because how to determine when a person has become annoying or too intense is of course a cultural process. So it, I don't think it's surprising that these terms are mentioned in Costa Rica, which is a country that has really incorporated as a premise, the myth of being the most peaceful people on earth. If there's a Costa Rican listening to this, I'm sure uh, he or she will agree. So peaceful in Costa Rican culture usually means not disturbing the status quo. So as a human-like being, Spotify's algorithmic recommendations also need to comply with local rules of what it means to be a friend or, and what it means to behave in public. Users does prefer that algorithms hide their face rather than draw attention to them by providing one too many unsolicited recommendations that re disrupt harmony. To understand the second position, I turn to the work of Ted Porter and his amazing book, Trusting Numbers, one of the best books I, I've ever read, I think. Uh, Porter famously argued that quantification is a technology of, of distance, right? It allows us to see phenomena from afar. But users in this case tended to value it for the opposite reason. It made them feel closer to a world that they aspired to be of. 
So they valued algorithmic recommendations sort of as a technology of proximity um, that helped them feel connected to global conversations about music and technology. So I argue that this tension between the local and the global is explained primarily through Anne Swidler's notion of culture. Culture as a toolkit or a bag of resources that provides individuals with certain, certain kinds of capacities. People rejected or followed algorithms to integrate capacities, three specific capacities in, into their lives. One, to be a specific kind of person, two, to negotiate a sense of belonging in certain social groups, and three, to sustain or strengthen ongoing social relationships. So at the end of the day, it was about these capacities rather than algorithms per se. And, and finally, TikTok allows us to, to further identify a third dynamic of integration namely how people incorporate their experiences of different platforms into them, their understandings of algorithms. So as I said, I am taking inspiration on Pablo and Eugenia's idea that we live in, in digital environments, right? And I argue that establishing relationships between platforms is a key dimension of these digital environments in that they shape how we relate to algorithms. So people tended to establish four specific uh, kinds of relationships um, between TikTok and other platforms. First, they differentiated TikTok from other platforms. And when they did so, they argued that they could better understand the specificities of TikTok's algorithms. So in this quote on the left, this person is convinced that she was able to actually understand how TikTok, alg TikTok's algorithms behave or operated by distinguishing them from how actually Instagram works. But on other occasions, people minimize those differences between apps and suggest that they all belong to a group with common characteristics, the classic social media. On these occasions, they integrated the practices they had with other platforms into their experience with TikTok. So this user that I quote here on, on the right noted that since he thought Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter worked in a certain way, he would do exactly the same things he did on those apps while using TikTok. Algorithms also work as relational categories when users thought that TikTok extended the history of other apps, including some that had already disappeared. So here, what users integrated was a cultural expectation. They evaluated TikTok by assessing whether its algorithms allowed them to reproduce their experience with apps such as Vine. And finally, uh, users also inverted the direction of the comparison by considering TikTok as a new paradigmatic technology, the case that makes intelligible a particular feature in other apps. On such occasions, they exported user practices and expectations from TikTok to the relationships with the algorithms of other apps. So to, to summarize, by considering what I've called integration, I want to emphasize that algorithmic choices don't occur in, in a cultural void. Algorithmic recommendations need to be culturally enacted in particular ways that involve incorporating certain criteria, certain capacities, and certain relationships. So finally, the, the last cultural dynamic that I'd like to discuss are rituals, right? Which is a classic in communication studies, or it, it means just the ways in which users link, in this case, algorithms to mundane activities in a systematic way, and then create consumption practices through which they can organize temporal and spatial processes. And I wanna make two specific arguments regarding algorithms and rituals. First, that compared to previous media technologies, rituals have actually proliferated rather than diminished. I'll, I'll use the case of Netflix to illustrate this. And second, that rituals show how our relationship with algorithms are much more effective, uh, effective as, as in infused with affect than what has been recognized in the literature. And I'll use the case of Spotify to illustrate this. So our users or the users that I talked with uh, reported having three kinds of rituals in the case of Netflix. Some more individual, some more collective, and a third one, which was very interesting, which is a mix between the two. So in individual rituals, Netflix works as a companion to ordinary activities the same way other media have done in the past, right? But the possibility to watch content on multiple devices, such as television sets, smartphones, tablets, and at different times throughout the day, makes Netflix ideal for this kind of ritual, right? So users look for specific kinds of content to carry out this ritual, uh, particularly shows which, given that they are episodic and which helps the repetitive nature of the ritual and shorter than movies and does make it easier to allocate time throughout the day. Collective rituals instead are pre uh, occur at pre pre-established times in the day and include other uh, participants. So rituals matter also because they represent a means to define ways of being social. 
So in addition to a form of entertainment, collective rituals are ways to maintain a bond with someone else. So the most common content for this kind of ritual were movies, right, which have a specific duration and a certain kind of narratives that help to bound uh, the ritual temporally. And I also identify this third type of practice that bridges uh, individual and collective rituals. So many users indicated that they watch certain shows simultaneously, with, especially with friends at a distance, right? So in, in a way it's an individual ritual because the user is alone when she watches the content, but it's, it is also collective because someone else is doing it simultaneously somewhere else. And they typically refer to this uh, as a Netflix party and they even use add-ons to, to actually uh, being able to do so. So this proliferation of rituals matters to me because it is precisely through them that we act out the centrality of platforms in digital environments. They are a, a key way for users to actually assess the relevance of algorithmic recommendations. So if the recommendation fits the ritual, then it becomes much more meaningful to people than if it doesn't. And my final example today seeks to sort of reveal how important affect is in our relationship with algorithms. And I illustrate this with the case of a user who, re when releasing some songs on Spotify, asked his followers on Instagram to include them on a number of suggested playlists. So he invited others to include his music on playlists for, uh, such as for crying while, while you drink a bottle of red wine, but never white wine because that's disgusting. That's the name of the, of the playlist. That's not my interpretation. Uh, playlist for being happy while you drink a beer next to a pool playlist for looking outside the window while you are on the bus or for those moments when you feel you're living in a movie. So I argue here that playlists represent a form of ritual through which users seek to cultivate moods and emotions, right? So I refer to this as affect cultivation, the tendency to ritually seek to create an intensity with which users can actually produce, capture or explore moods and emotions in their lives. So what I did here was to follow the trajectories of these mood cultivation rituals, uh, how they began with the sense in users that affect demanded them a response by creating a new playlist, how these demands evolved into efforts to translate affect into a specific kind of object, a playlist with a certain order, a personality, style, a rhythm, and, and even a, a certain cover. And finally, I considered how users felt the need to share these objects their playlists with others by creating what Lauren Berlin would call an intimate public, a sense of attachment to others located in fantasies of the common, right? And the everyday, an intimate public then would form when playlists circulate and users find in them a representation of their affective interests. I would even suggest that the ritual practice of responding to an effective exigence through the creation of playlists is uh, the genre of our time. Um, Genres are, to me at least, not so much about the particular features of a music style. I think they are fusions of a certain musical substance, particular technologies and social material practices. Uh, and because of the ease it provides to this process, users, users have turned to Spotify into an obligatory intermediary in the establishment of an utilitarian relationship with music. So this effective attachment is at the core of um, users' relationship with algorithms. When users, like the one I quote on the left, feel that platforms have, become, have come to perfectly known their preferences, they tend to welcome al algorithmic recommendations, right? It is as if someone, a, a certain body who knows them very well would recommend music to them. But others, uh, like the user I quote on the right of the screen, seem much more cautious of algorithms. So they tend to criticize them for producing affect that is perceived as artificial rather than organic. So the evidence this user puts forth is purely affective. It is to have personally experienced what being on the bus going home, uh, the name of a playlist that was recommended to him, uh, actually feels like. So, to conclude and leave sufficient time to hopefully have a discussion about this, uh, I would like to, to I would like to say I, I was hoping to have shown two things in this project. Uh, first, that inverting America in both senses of the expression is a worthy intellectual project. So in other words, that focusing on people's practices and cultural dynamics in the South can help us further understand aspects of datafication that aren't necessarily obvious when we privilege tech company strategies or the logics of platforms themselves, or only the logics of platforms. So for this particular reason, I would argue that the notion of hegemony 
perhaps works better than colonialism or platformization to account for that application. Because on the one hand, it, it situates culture as a site of dispute, and on the other, it endows people with more agency than uh, what I think work on data colonialism and platformization has done. And second, the study of algorithmic power and users uh, as agents of technological change has often been framed in oppositional terms. So by positing mutual domestication as cyclical, I want to argue that instead, when you look at people's relationship with algorithms uh, empirically, both processes are in constant interaction, right? It is precisely, uh, I would like to suggest, in this cyclical interaction that current debates uh, about the role of algorithms in redefining, standardizing, or enriching culture must be situated. Uh, well, thank you for your attention. Hopefully, uh, you'll have some, some questions and comments about this, and I'll be happy to discuss them with you. Thank you very much, Ignacio. This was a terrific presentation, a real masterclass. Uh, so we invite the people to uh, insert their questions in the Q&A. Uh, but we can start with one question that we already received which is from Eugenia Mitterstein, and she, said, she asked, uh, why do you think that what algorithms and do, are doing to people approach has been so popular, even among scholars who will never employ the hypodermic neither metaphor for other type of media? Uh, hi, Eugenia, I hope you're doing well. Thank you for that question. It's actually a, a very good question. And for, on, on the one hand, I would say, because it's fascinating. It's fascinating to look at what these tech companies are doing and even to criticize them. I think we are uh, on many occasions just blown away by the level of sophistication and the techniques they employ. And, and, and we have also been able, or scholars have been able to sort of identify the biases that are inscribed into algorithms. So I think that that plays a, a huge role, right? It, it is. To some people, it is more interesting to talk about technology than to talk about people, right? And, and I think there's a certain sense of fascination with the techniques and the level of sophistication employed by these uh, companies that if you add that to the, the sense of, of, yeah, of, of sophistication really uh, of what they do, I think that it leads us into believing that that's the only thing that is going on, right? And again, I don't want to suggest that I don't think that's going on. I, I do think that people are actually, that these tech companies should be criticized for all they're doing, uh, but that's not the only thing that's going on. That's what I was trying to convey uh, in the presentation. Great, thank you. Um, I, I have a, a question for you, Ignacio. Um, I wanted to know if this, uh, through this characterization and personification that people uh, do uh, from algorithm, uh, and if people in some way define or characterize what relies behind those algorithms, if they see that uh, those algorithms uh, respond to companies or governments, and if you consider that uh, this personification of algorithm in some way is uh, a form in which uh, they can uh, kind of uh, think in a disembodied way of power that at the same time uh, companies try to promote because I think it's a good way that people try to perceive that it, there is something there that they are not part of the company. Yeah, that's an interesting question too. There's a book in, from 1996 by, I think it was Reeves and Nass uh, that is called The Media Equation where they, when, where they argue that, uh, I mean, this phenomenon of personifying the media and technology is, it, I mean, it, it has decades, right, going on. And so their argument is that cognitively, we know that we're not interacting with a person, uh, but our brain it, has evolved mostly from interactions with other people. So that's our only referent, right? And so even if we know we're not interacting with people, then we, our brain tricks us into applying the only thing we've known historically into uh, our relationship with things. Um, so I think that's sort of the explanation going on here. There was very few instances of people concerned about the power of, of technology because at the end of the day, they were interacting with a, a body, a friend, <laughs> even if it's, a, an intense or an annoying friend, 
uh, it remains at the end of the day. So at the end, because this project has taken us three years, I mean, we've been doing this for three years. Perhaps this year I've noticed a little bit more concerns uh, among some interviewees regarding the power that media, uh, the platform companies might have or what they do with the data. But for the most part, I would say that's really not a, uh, an important concern for them because at the end of the day, it provides uh, this sense of being, uh, of, of having an intermediary uh, between them and their friends that allows them to interact with them. So uh, if they have to collect their data, then so be it because at the end of the day, and I'm quoting, um, I, I'm not doing anything that's, that I wouldn't share with my friends anyway. Uh, so I think that's sort of the, the logic behind. There was an, an interesting, regarding to, to your question, there was an interesting change when we did work, field work with um, TikTok users. So that was the first time in which very quickly the users that we interviewed mentioned the word algorithm explicitly. Within 10 minutes of, into the conversation, they would mention the word algorithm without us bringing uh, up bringing the, the, the concept into our questions or mentioning algorithms as part of our questions. Uh, so I, perhaps uh, there's a change uh, along the lines that you suggest taking place. I, I guess we'd have to wait a little bit longer to find out, um, but that, or maybe that was more uh, a thing of the social, of the demographics of the people we were interviewing who were more aware that algorithms or the term algorithm and to what it applies. Uh, but for the most part, people wouldn't, wouldn't even bring necessarily the term algorithms, but, you know, this recommendation and stuff like that. Okay, thank you, Ignacio. We have another question in the uh, Q&A. Uh, it said, fantastic presentation. Uh, are you considering the people who are behind this algorithm? I think kind of the, uh, what we're talking about recently, but if you can add some thought on this. Uh, the, the, the person said, sometimes we forgot that algorithms are made by individuals, companies, uh, and have some specific purposes. Do users acknowledge that fact? Is that relationship part of the analysis? Uh, so to answer the first part of the question, well, hi, and thank you for the question, first of all, uh, Diego. I've also read your work about uh, communication with bots and algorithmic bots, by, by the way. Uh, so to answer the first part of the question, I haven't interviewed, you know, uh, um, designers or computer scientists or people who actually develop algorithms for this project. I've done so for other projects in the past, but not, not for this one. I was literally just interviewing ordinary people in their daily life who have, um, who interact with these platforms. And so that's not part of the, of the analysis. I think that that's what has occupied most of scholars' attention. Uh, sort of the biases that are inscribed, because as you very well say, uh, these algorithms are created by people with their inscribing their own their own understanding of the world and under, their own biases, uh, and so they materialize that. And I think that has been fascinating for for most scholars when they uh, approach the subject of algorithms. So I wanted to go the other way, completely the other way. Um, and when you interview just the users. There were mentions of companies, so companies like an abstract thing. Uh, so I'm interacting with Netflix, the company. Uh, so people would mix, for example, this sense of personification and say things like, I don't know why Netflix would give me this recommendation. I mean, we've, we've talked for, we've known each other for so long and, and how come he would give me this, this, this recommendation? Um, but never, I, I didn't find any reference to, you know, the designers of these technologies or the programmers who coded this. Uh, so people think are, they are interacting with a person like being or a company in the abstract, which is personified by, by this, by the platform. But um, I, I didn't find, or I don't recall, you know, finding people actually thinking, well, this, th there is a bias um, here operating or going on. Maybe, or the only instance that somewhat close to that was a woman who actually felt that there was a bias inscribed into recommendations of gendered content on, on, on Netflix, for example. That was probably the only instance of, of a few women saying, well, uh, what's going on here? Who, who did this? Why am I receiving so many recommendations about you know, marriages or, or reality shows about dating? Thanks for the question. I have another question from Chile. Uh, thank you very much for that fascinating presentation, Ignacio. 
I really like your approach and, uh, and I find that there are many bridges uh, with a project that we are currently out here. You talk generate, your talk generates in me the doubt that we also ask ourselves when delving into the perspective and effect on non-experts about algorithms. How do you take care of the link between what people think algorithms do and what they actually do in practice? Uh, thank you, Matthias. That's a very interesting question as well. Uh, it's a different. It's a difficult one, I think, because you uh, you have to devise a uh, sort of a, a method that allows you to do sort of both. So one way which we tried to do that was during our um, you know interviews, we would open their accounts and literally go with their permission, of course, to uh, the history of what the things they had seen. Uh, the specific recommendations they had uh, reflected on their accounts. And so we would only talk about that, not about, you know, what, what this person might have remembered that she did on the platform. So in that way, we were uh, sort of inviting them to link those dimensions, what they understood about algorithms and what the platform reflected they had done. Um, but it's a challenge. Uh, I guess there are other ways to do that and it would take I don't know, longitudinal research to sort of um, do different things at different points in time. I've seen people do that. Like there are researchers in France who have done that, sort of compare different moments in time um, in what kind of practices and, and songs, for example, uh, have changed or evolved during the time. And they would use that sort of as an indication that something changed in practice and then compared how they understood algorithms. But we decided to do this other route in which we would open the account and just talk about that and, and ask them for the, their explanations and their um, sort of how they made sense of what they had already done, so to speak. Okay, we have our very last question. Alejandra from Costa Rica said, congratulations for your interest presentation. Don't worry, Alejandra, my English is regular too. Uh, and she said, do you consider that marketers have to include platform TikTok in their marketing and communication plans for their brand and strategies? And what do you think about Ocean Spray's action with the viral video about their brand? Thank you so much. Okay, I, I have to admit that, thank you, Alejandra. I hope you're, you're well. I have, I have to admit that I'm, I'm not really sure if I can answer this question. Uh, I couldn't sell anything if my life depended on it. So I, uh, that's really not an area that I have explored neither in my work or in my practice. Um, so I don't know, I don't know, I guess. Um, I, I really couldn't say anything about it regarding uh, or based on the, on the data that I've collected for this project, it really goes outside of the, of the things I was doing here. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not able to comment or elaborate on, on it. All right, thank you very much, Ignacio. This is we are perfect on time. This has been an incredibly enlightening presentation. I, I have a million questions that I refrain from asking so that I will give the public a chance. Um, I, I send the questions to you sort of privately, but it's, it's been super, super interesting. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you, Facundo, for great moderation. Thanks everybody in the audience uh, for joining us. And I want to uh, invite you for the next installment of our seminar series on uh, Tuesday, election day in the US. Actually, we'll have Arthur Soto Vasquez from Texas A&M uh, presenting his book on uh, the Latinx uh, population, media, and elections in the US. So very, very timely uh, on election day. And But please, before attending or after, vote. Those of you who are in the US, vote. Okay, uh, I wish everybody a great rest of your weeks and I will see you all again in the next seminar of uh, the digital, Latinx Digital Media Center. Thank you, thank you, Ignacio again and Facundo. Thank you, bye.